Alexander, considered by many the greatest man to ever live, in his short life his indomitable spirit would see Macedonian Greek armies reach the very edge of the known world. In the ensuing wars of conquest he raged, he bent the very reality he lived into his will. Alexander truly created a new world. The origins of Alexander were illustrious in of themselves. The direct descendant of Achilles, the son of the great Macedonian Greek king Philip II, and Olympias, daughter of a neighboring kingdom. Alexander would soon outshine all of these legacies. On the day he was born, Philip's general Parmenion won a great victory. Philip's horse won its race at the Olympic Games, and the Temple of Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, burned to the ground as the gods focused their energies into bringing Alexander into this world. When Alexander was ten years old, his father had purchased a massive horse which was so wild that none of his men could tame it. Alexander, already demonstrating his genius, realized it was because the horse was afraid of its own shadow. He mounted the horse and tamed it himself, naming it Bucephalus. Witnessing this, Philip broke down in tears, kissing his son and saying, My boy, you must find a kingdom big enough for your ambitions. Macedon is too small for you. Bucephalus' fear of his own shadow was created by the gods as a message to Alexander. It forced him to forever ride east, towards the rising sun and his destiny. Growing up, Alexander was tutored by Aristotle himself, one of the greatest philosophical minds of all time. Furthermore, he was surrounded with the most promising men of the entire kingdom, among them Ptolemy, Erios, Nearchus, and his BFF and loyal ally Hephaestion. These guys will be around a while, I can promise that. Meanwhile, Philip had performed the Macedonian army as the most alpha fighting force in the world. Among his many brilliant innovations was the Macedonian phalanx formation, wielding gigantic spear called Sarissas. This unit, though not very maneuverable, was unstoppable as long as its flanks were properly covered. By age 16, Alexander was commanding his father's armies, had defeated several rebellions, and had conquered new lands for Macedon. He even named a city after himself, Alexandropolis, who would be the first of many. As the two heroes secured and expanded the frontiers of Macedon, they faced a massive coalition of Greek city-states at the decisive Battle of Chaeronea. In the melee, the 18-year-old Alexander commanded the elite companion cavalry for the first time. It was a massive slugfest, with neither side gaining an advantage, until Philip feigned a retreat and Alexander bravely launched his cavalry straight at the best soldiers of the opposing armies, a bunch of queers called the Sacred Band of Thieves. The elite of both armies met in a deadly and desperate melee. Through Alexander's personal courage and ambition, the Macedonians were able to overcome the spearmen routing the enemy. Seeing their best soldiers slaughtered, the remainder of the coalition army simply shat their pants and fled the field. Subjugated, the other Greek states were subsumed into the Hellenic League. Philip intended to wield this powerful coalition in a glorious pan-Hellenic crusade against the barbarians of the Persian Achaemenid Empire. However, for every truly grand and visionary spirit, there are a hundred weak-willed and reactionary men who fail to grasp a greater future, who are filled only with desire for the selfish comforts in life. Thus, Philip was slain by men afraid of the dawning of a new era, though Leonidas and Perdiccas would ensure they did not escape. But little did those traitors know, an even greater dreamer would rise to take his place. The 20-year-old Alexander took the throne and immediately set out to unify the entire Greek world with his sheer force of personality. He started by executing everyone involved in the plot against his father and then son. Anyone whose loyalty could be questioned was purged or killed. Next, he put down several revolts by opportunistic city-states, led by some retard orator that modern autists still worship for some reason, Demosthenes. But most of these armies capitulated upon the mere sight of Alexander, seeing with their own eyes his aura of divinity. Then, he further reformed the Macedonian army, finding the biggest brained engineers he could. Alexander revolutionized siege warfare by vastly improving siege rams and towers, and creating the world's first torsion catapult. Even better, his engineers designed these weapons so that they could be easily deconstructed and carried with his army. Thus, for the first time in the history of warfare, an army did not have to build new siege weapons from scratch everywhere they went. He marched on. Alexander sought out the famous Cynic philosopher Diogenes. For those of you who are not already faithful disciples of Diogenes, I'll explain. 
He was the first man to realize the truth, that civilization inevitably leads to degeneracy. Thus, Diogenes rejected the modern world before it was cool, and his followers would later create Stoicism. Diogenes would even jack off in public just to assert his dominance over angry virgins. Wanting to do the old legendary man a favor, Alexander exclaimed, If I were not Alexander, I would want to be Diogenes. To which Diogenes replied, If I were not Diogenes, I would also wish to be Diogenes. Around this time, Alexander visited the famous oracle Pythia, asking for a divination. She refused to even speak to Alexander. Remembering how the same oracle had disrespected his father some years ago, the god king walked into her chamber, dragged her out by the hair, kicking and screaming until she finally admitted the truth, yelling, You are invincible, my son! Alexander simply replied, Now I have my answer. He then moved to secure his northern frontier. In a lightning campaign, Alexander defeated the Thracians twice, crushed the Triballi, crossed the Danube by using freaking tents filled with hay to float across the river, obliterated the Getai, then floated back across to annihilate two Illyrian kingdoms at Pelion. Of course, some Greeks, led by Demosthenes, took the opportunity Alexander's absence left to rebel yet again. But Alexander was not to be trifled with. Witnessing the rapid, unexpected approach of Alexander's returning army, most Greeks immediately prostrated themselves before him once more, all except for the Thebans, who were still butthurt over the loss of Chaeronea. But long ago, the Thebans had unwittingly taught Philip all their tricks while he was held in captivity. Thus stood Alexander, the champion of all Greek civilization, as he turned his gaze east in early 334 BC. Most doubted his vision. The Macedonian treasury was empty because Alexander had magnanimously ended taxation in Greece. Most Greek city-states were nonetheless looking for any opportunity to revolt, and the Persian Empire was as rich as it was massive and powerful. But Olympias then told Alexander the truth. The night he was conceived. Olympias was possessed by Zeus himself in the form of a lightning bolt. Alexander was thus not just a man, he was a god. His loyal old friend Antipater behind his regent, Alexander took 50,000 men across the Hellespont in a Panhellenic Crusade. His objective, you may ask? To civilize the entire world. He would never return. Landing near Troy, Alexander leapt from his ship, thrusting his spear deep into the sand, proclaiming that he accepted Asia as his gift from the gods. Inside the city, Alexander confiscated many weapons left over from the Trojan War, giving them to his best men for divine protection, Pufkestus among them. Finally, Alexander paid respects to the tomb of his direct ancestor Achilles and begged forgiveness from the grave of the last great Trojan king, Priam. Alexander then marched along the coast, seeking the enemy. As he liberated Greek cities, Alexander ensured his soldiers greeted the civilians as brothers, preventing any bloodshed or looting. As the local Persian satraps witnessed their oppressed subjects happily embrace the righteous Macedonian banner, they called a council of war to decide what new way to seed this time. In this meeting, various Persian governors squabbled over semantic bullshit. The only thing they could really agree on was that they had to stop Alexander lest they lose all their shekels. However, there was actually a man in the room who had at least two brain cells to rub together. He was also the only man in the room who wasn't a Persian. The corrupted Memnon of Rhodes argued that they should adopt a scorched earth strategy, as there was absolutely zero effing chance the virgin Persians could hope to defeat the Chad Macedonian army. But in a moment truly indicative of all human history, Shekels spoke louder than reason. Thus, the Persian horde formed up across the Granicus River one evening. 
They were formed up in the traditional Achaemenid battle formation, which had conquered most of the known world. Infantry consisted of a row of Sparabara shield bearers, which formed a shield wall protecting many rows of archers. As Persian arrows blotted out the sky, any attacking enemies would be slaughtered, while the elite Persian cavalry charged and destroyed their opposing flanks. This accomplished, the Sparabar could then charge forwards while the archers change weapons to fight as normal infantry. The results were often devastating, and Alexander was well aware of this threat. Alexander had a difficult decision to make, and all the men assembled awaited the king's move. As Alexander approached, Parmenion, his best general, cautioned that he should wait until the morning before drawing battle. The two armies gazed across at one another, the Persians baiting the Greeks to attack. Then, out of nowhere, Alexander surged forward at the front of his companion cavalry. He moved with such ferocity that the Persian horsemen couldn't hit him, obliterating the confused enemy and cleaving a path through their lines. The Persian elite swarmed to face Alexander, hoping to kill him and end the war in a single blow. Alongside him was Parmenion's son Philotas, a brave yet self-absorbed virgin commander. As Alexander and the companions tried to break through and envelop the Persian lines, the Macedonian phalanx moved forward to pin down the Persian center and opposite flank. Many good men fell, but the Macedonian advance was unstoppable. The enemy's discipline rapidly deteriorated. Alexander killed so many enemies that his lance broke from overuse. Grabbing another lance from a companion, Alexander leapt back into the fight, killing the son-in-law of Darius with a lance through his face. At this moment, another noble struck Alexander on the head with such force that his helmet split. But all this had done was expose Alexander's holy locks, the glory of which burned the mortal man alive. Finally, a third noble snuck behind Alexander, about to deliver a killing blow before Cletus the Black appeared out of nowhere and cut the noble's arm off in a single strike. Witnessing the unstoppable God King slaughter the best the Persians had to offer, the remainder of the Persian army fled, but Alexander wasn't interested in pursuing the Persians. Instead, he surrounded some 20,000 Greek mercenaries who had betrayed their countrymen for Persian gold. Imagining that surely Alexander would simply pay them to fight for him, they surrendered without a fight. But Alexander had different ideas. <laughs> the traitors were utterly massacred. Alexander had proven his point. <laughs>